Well, welcome to our virtual panel T1, The Lure of Dangerous Geographies. It's my pleasure to introduce our two presenters. Our first presenter is Professor Harald Höbisch. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Professor of German Studies in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages, Literatures and Cultures at the University of Kentucky. Professor Höbisch also serves as the editor of Colloquia Germanica, an international peer-reviewed journal in the field of German literary and cultural studies. His research broadly focuses on German literature and culture of the first half of the 20th century and is particularly interested in the various representations in print, film, and audio of German, but increasingly also of French, Italian, and British expeditions during the golden age of Himalaya mountaineering. Professor Höbisch is the author of two books, Mountain of Destiny, Nanga Parbat and its Path into the German Imagination, and Thomas Mann, Kunstkritik Politik, 1893-1913, as well as numerous articles on German Himalaya mountaineering. He also contributed to the 2015 BBC production titled Battle for the Himalayas, the fight to film Everest. The title of his talk today is From Kanchen Junga to Nanga Parbat, The Himalayan Diaries of Hans Hartmann's Germany. It is my pleasure to introduce also our second presenter, Professor Kishwar Zafir, Assistant Professor in the Department of English at Aligarh Muslim University in India. Professor Zafir teaches both undergraduate and postgraduate students and supervises doctoral research in English literature as well as ELT. Her areas of specialization include post-colonial studies, eco-criticism, Muslim women's writings, Gothic studies, folk studies, and sociolinguistics. Professor Zafir's presentation today is titled Rokea Sakhavat Hossein, A Feminist Voice, from the east. Before we begin, let me just remind you that each of our presenters will have 20 minutes and then we will open the room for questions after that. With that being said, Professor Herbush. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professors Bieberman and Sane, for uh, making this uh, panel uh, possible and um, especially moving my uh, talk from uh, in person to virtual. I really appreciate your effort on, on my behalf here. Um, I'm going to start with simply sharing my screen and um, clicking through the slides as I give my presentation. So here we go. Never has a mountain occupied the German imagination longer and more thoroughly than Nanga Pabat, the world's ninth highest peak, located in the extreme western part of uh, in present day of the Himalayas in present day Pakistan. Repeatedly referred to by 1930s mountaineers as the German mountain of destiny, Nanga Parbat over a period of roughly two decades between 1932 and 1953 became not only the destination of six German mountaineering expeditions, but also the quintessential German quote mountain of the mind onto whose slopes German mountaineers, mountaineering officials, politicians, writers, and filmmakers would project some of the most pressing social, political, and cultural concerns of their time. In my presentation today, I intend to explore the reasons behind the surprising popularity of the Himalayan diaries of Dr. Hans Hartmann, one of the preeminent German mountaineers and high altitude physiologists of the interwar period. Hartmann's two diaries, Kanchenjunga Diary from 1934 and Destination Nanga Parbat, Diary Sheets of, the Himal of a Himalaya Expedition, published in 1938, were some of the most popular and widely read first in accounts of German mountaineering efforts in the Himalayas during the 1930s, complementing a series of equally popular official expedition reports and documentary films. The text at the center of my talk, Hartmann's posthumously published diary, Destination Nanga Parbat, appeared in 1938 and was reprinted no less than four times in 1942, 43, 45, and even uh, 44, and even 1945. 
The belated popularity of Hartmann's diary, I will argue, is due to two factors. One, the intensely personal quality of Hartmann's text, its exquisite descriptions of the local landscapes in its inhabitants, their rituals, and his emotional response to them, and two, the unfaltering spirit of attack expressed in Hartmann's text that not only reveals the degree of intensity to which he and his comrades were prepared to take the quote-unquote fight on the German mountain of destiny, but also identifies the German mountaineers as part of a legacy of warriors that reaches far back into German history, a message with great propagandistic potential, especially during World War II. Nagar Parat entered the German imagination in 1932 as the result of a growing fascination of German mountaineers with the tallest mountains in the world. In the years following World War I, Germany, Germany's leading climbers had begun to set their sights on goals located well beyond their traditional area of activity, the European Alps. In the decade between 1928 and 1939, German expeditions repeatedly traveled to such remote locations as the Andes, the Caucasus, the Pamir, and most importantly, the Himal Himalaya. In 1929, the Munich notary and mountaineer Dr. Paul Bauer had organized the first German Himalaya expedition to Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world. In 1930, the Internationale Himalaya Expedition organized and led by Breslau professor, Dr. Günther Oskar Dürenfurt set out to conquer Kanchenjunga once more, but like Bauer the previous year, failed to reach the summit. Kanchenjunga remained one of the primary goals for German mountaineers during the 1930s. 1931 marked the year of the second German Kanchenjunga expedition, again under the leadership of Paul Bauer. However, in the dreams of German mountaineers at the time, Kanchenjunga was soon replaced by Nanga Parbat, which you can see here in the background, perceived to be the easiest of all 8,000 meter peaks. The fact that Nanga Parbat had been quote unquote discovered by one of their countrymen undoubtedly contributed to the claim by 1930s mountaineers that Nanga Parbat was a quote unquote German mountain. Bauer, for instance, repeatedly pointed to Adolf Schlagentweit as the first European paying attention to the mountain and sending news of its existence to Europe. To him, Adolf Schlagentweit was the true and quote unquote discoverer of Nanga Parbat. Nanga Parbat mountaineer, Nanga Parbat's mountaineering history during the 1930s is a history of tragedy. During two expeditions conducted under National Socialist rule in 1934 and 1937, the mountain exerted the terrifying death toll of 26 individuals. The fate of German mountaineers and Nanga Parbat gathered widespread attention in the media. The progress of the expeditions received almost daily coverage in newspapers throughout the Reich, triggered a steady stream of official expedition reports and popular Nanga Parbat books, both for young and adult readers, and was depicted in two widely screened documentaries, Nanga Parbat, a battle account of the 1934 German Himalaya expedition from 1936 and struggle for the Himalaya from 1938. One of the mountaineers killed on the 1937 expedition was Hans Hartmann. During the night of June 14, Hartmann, six of his fellow German climbers and nine porters were buried in an avalanche leveling their camp. Immediately after receiving news of the disaster, the German Himalaya Foundation launched a rescue expedition to the mountain. After several days of digging through the avalanche, it was able to locate and lay to rest the bodies of five German mountaineers. In addition, it was able to retrieve most of the deceased's personal belongings, including their including the diaries, as well as the film material of the 1937 expedition. Hans Hartmann's Nanga Parbat diary was among them. Hans Hartmann's diary, Destination Nanga Parbat, a slim volume of roughly 100 print pages published in 1938, had an initial print run of only 5,000 copies. More interestingly, however, Hartmann's text was subsequently reprinted a total of four times. The print run of the second expedition alone was 10,000 copies. This begs the question, what accounted for the belated popularity of Hartmann's diary? <clears throat> On the surface, Hartmann simply retells the events of the 1937 expedition 
in a fashion which, at least in structural terms, is very similar to any other mountaineering expedition report. But Hartmann's diary contains much more than a generic accumulation of facts. Like no other account from that period, it is a document of one individual's fascination, if not obsession, with the German mountain of destiny. This obsession is expressed most visibly in a famous poem by German World War I poet Walter Flex, a poem Hartmann places at the very beginning of his first diary entry and quotes from three additional times in his text, so to speak, his leitmotiv. I quote, what is suffering to me? I'm bound by an oath that glows like fire through sword and heart and hands. Let it end the way it ends, Germany, I'm prepared, end quote. In conjunction with further reflections upon the events of the 1931 Kanjunga expedition and the tragic fate of the 1934 attempt on Nanga Parbat, Hartmann's motivations for joining in the 1937 team soon become clear. A desire to fulfill the legacy of previous Nanga Parbat expeditions, a longing to once again partake in the comradeship of earlier climbs and a sense of duty to the German nation. Hartmann's unequaled fascination with Nanga Parbat manifests itself in several diary entries. For May 13, for instance, while traveling towards the foot of the mountain, Hartmann reports the following vision, and I quote, I see the snow on the silver saddle glisten in the, glistening uh, in the evening light and envision Willow Welzenbach and Wille Merkel, both of whom had died on Nanga Parbat in 1934, taking their final steps not far from Rocky Hill Peak. This goes on the entire day until evening. I am obsessed by thoughts about our mountain. Today, I've seen the summit of Nanga Parbat, it is alive in me, end quote. Hartmann's emotional connection with Nangar Parbat, however, manifests itself most clearly when in several instances he addresses the mountain directly as if it were a living entity, end quote. Yes, you are truly a fairy meadow, and I will be content and grateful for having been given the opportunity to see you and your mountain on a spring morning. And just one page later, now we are here, Nangar Parbat, end quote. With these personal characteristics of Hartmann's text, uh, while these personal characteristics of Hartmann's text and its often exquisite descriptions of the local landscape, its people and their rituals may indeed explain some of its popularity with readers, especially against the background of the wildly popular 1920s and 1930s expedition reports by Swedish scientist and explorer Sven Hedin, British painter and author Arnold Henry Savage Landor, German geographer Wilhelm Filchner and French explorer and writer Alexandra David Neel, they cannot explain why it was reprinted four times during World War II. What else is there in Hartmann's text that could explain its continuing publication? I suggest that it is the unfaltering spirit of attack expressed throughout Hartmann's account. This spirit of attack is reflected most clearly in a brief passage in when Hartmann refers to himself and his fellow mountaineers as a quote unquote forlorn troop that is doing nothing but its duty. With this use of a term originally found in 16th century German war songs titled The Peasants Want to Be Free and referring to an advanced party of the Lanskanet formations at the time of Empress Maximilian II and Charles V whose chances of survival in battle were minimal, Hartmann not only reveals the degree of intensity to which he and his comrades are prepared, prepared to take the quote-unquote fight on the mountain, but also in that identifies himself as part of a legacy of warriors that reaches far back into German history. Several other passages from the second half of Hartmann's Nanga Parbat diary attest to the same spirit. Faced by inclement weather towards the end of May, its author describes how he is tempted to agree with the gloomy predictions of one of his fellow climbers. But recalling a line from Walter Flex's poem, what is suffering to me, he states, and I quote, and once again, I became hard, peaceful, and self-assured, end quote. On June 3rd, his entry for the day ends with the following line, and I quote, we slip into our sleeping bags and are happy to finally be on the mountain again, and that things are moving forward, end quote. Finally, four days before the catastrophe during the night of June 14, and in the face of heavy snowfall, Hartmann's optimism manifests itself one more time. Quote, we sit together for another half hour and talk about the weather and the mountain and about the men who will conquer it despite all obstacles, end quote. 
The suspicion that the quote unquote spirit of attack expressed in Hartmann's diary was indeed the reason it was reprinted several times during World War II grows even stronger when we take a look at the afterword written by fellow scientist Mountaineer and actually um, Hartmann's uh, uh, assistant, Dr. Ulrich Luft. In it, Luft recalls Hartmann's life and career and, in the process, highlights a number of his character traits, most importantly, Hartmann's unyielding willpower on his mountaineering endeavors. Luft's afterward provides an interpretive framework for the events described and the attitude manifested in Hartmann's diary, presenting them as a, quote, legacy of the dead comrades end quote, to be fulfilled by future expeditions on the mountain, and more importantly, as a prime example of, and I quote, the will to action of the German youth. The reasons for the multiple reprints of Hans Hartmann's Nanga Power diary become even clearer when we further expand our investigative focus and look at three additional Nanga Power texts they, that were either also reprinted several times or published for the first time during World War II. The first of these texts, Fritz Bechtold's Germans on Nanga Parbat, the 1934 attack, was one of the most widely read expedition reports ever. 50,000 copies were printed for its first edition in 1935, another 20,000 copies followed the next year. Even in 1944, which saw the 12th edition of the volume, the astounding number of 50,000 copies was produced. Bechtel's report is prefaced by two statements by Reich sports leader Hans von Schammer and Osten and Wilhelm Kleinmann, deputy director of the German railroad. In his address, von Schammer and Osten links the deaths on the mountain to the fate of the German people at large and encourages the living and especially the young generation to adopt the qualities of those who died. Kleinmann too stresses the importance of the mountaineers' actions for the German nation. For him, Bechtel's book in its portrayal of the heroic struggle, and I quote, of, um, of the heroic struggle for Nanga Parbat, of the unbending iron will of the love for one's fatherland and of comradeship, end quote, reminds all Germans of the, quote, highest virtues of the courage to fight and the will to sacrifice, end quote. Bechtold's subsequent retelling of the 1934 expedition further underscores the meaning of that year's tragic events on the German mountain of destiny. They function as a signal, a call to arms for a new generation, I quote. It must be beautiful to return home with this mighty mountain as a trophy, but it is even greater to give one's life for such a goal in order to serve as a guiding light for the young hearts of future fighters, end quote. The popularity of Bechtel's book with the German reading audience on the one hand, and the fact that it was continued to be reprinted late into World War II on the other indicate two things. First, the widespread interest of the German public in the Naga Parbat expeditions of the early to mid 1930s. And second, the importance assigned to these expeditions and their verbal as well as visual representations to the public in the eyes of national socialist functionaries in connection with the political indoctrination of the German folk and its youth, especially as we shall see now in times of war. And I'm almost at the end of my presentation. The appropriation of Nanga Parbat expeditions and their often tragic outcome for purposes of war propaganda observed in connection with Bechtold's official 1934 expedition report can also be discerned in two accounts of German Nanga Parbat expeditions by authors unaffiliated with these enterprises. Both accounts were published exclusively during World War II, and both were aimed specifically at a young male reading audience. The first of these two texts, Adivi Kruger's novel, The Struggle for Nanga Parbat, was published in 1941 as volume 48 in the Aufwärts Jugendbücherei series of the Aufwärts, or Upwards, publishing firm in Berlin. The Aufwärts Jugendbücherei had been conceived in 1939 as part of a campaign by the Reich Ministry for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda to produce a range of youth booklets which were to impart national socialist ideology in direct propagandistic fashion. Its titles continued to be published into the final years of World War II. By the time Kruger's book appeared, of course, the German armed forces were already at war, they were lending both title and plot of Kruger's novel a high degree of timeliness and urgency. Drawing on the widespread fascination of the German public with pre-World War II Himalaya and especially Nanga Parbat expeditions, the novel dramatizes the ill-fated 1934 expedition to Nanga Parbat and in doing so celebrates the quote-unquote heroic qualities 
von Schama und Osten, Willem Kleinmann und Fritz Bechtold had assigned to German mountaineers in their respective commentaries and accounts. The notion of the selfless leader, together with such related concepts like loyalty, comradeship, and self-sacrifice to the death. Wilhelm Kreutzes, at the summit of Nanga Parbat, the second fictionalized account of the tragic 1934 Nanga Parbat expedition, appeared in the same year as Adebi Kruger's text, 1941, in the Erlebnisbücherei, a book series initiated by the Reich Ministry for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda and realized by the Steiniger Publishing Group in Berlin. Just like Kruger's text, it was part of a series of adventure stories that were aimed primarily at a young re male reading audience and often supportive of national socialist ideology. And again, like Kruger's text, Kreutz's version of the by now familiar story of the 1934 expedition pays special attention to several select issues. The idea of the mountaineering expedition as a national enterprise, the quote unquote heroic character traits of the German mountaineers, and the portrayal of Willy Merkel as a selfless leader and absolute authority figure. Both Adewe Kruger and Wilhelm Kreutz then used the tragic events of the German 1934 Nanga Parbat expedition as a vehicle to stress to the audience those qualities they, and with them, the national socialist leadership perceived to be of utmost importance to the German nation and especially its men in a time of war. An unbreakable fighting spirit, a strong sense of personal comradeship and national community, a spirit of sacrifice, and an unquestioning trust in authority. Their stories are therefore easily identifiable as belonging to what Norbert Hopster has characterized as a quote, modernized form of exemplary literature, a type of literature which in exemplary fashion demonstrates seemingly objective facts or necessities, end quote. In our case, how the quote, courage, energy and sacrifice of German men influences the fate of the German folk and future generations, end quote. In this particular process of exemplification, even failure or death, as with the German Nanga Parbat mountaineers, carries a deeper meaning. It enters those who succumbed to it into, quote, uh, the phalanx of the greats whose actions are being stylized as the force behind the folk's renewal, end quote. The ultimate purpose of this exemplification lies in the, quote, unquote, psychophysical recruitment of the young German male through the presentation of quote unquote warlike attitudes in the adventure literature of the Third Reich. Hans Hartmann's diary, Destin Nesin Nanga Parbat, I conclude, was appropriated and republished for exactly this purpose. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Herbusch. Professor Zephyr. Am I audible? Yes. All right. Um, I would say good morning to you people, but then it's like right now, 12 hours later. So it's like 10, 15 in the night. So um, I can like, can I begin my paper? Okay, thank you very much. So um, my paper is about uh, establishing Rukaya Sakawat Hussein as a feminist writer who belongs to the East. So this paper is about the achievement of this feminist thinker and writer of undivided India. Um, by the way, I have used quite a few words which are from uh, um, Hindi Urdu. So if you don't understand that, you can, you're can. you like, um, I mean, you're welcome to ask me that in the middle, but I'll just go on explaining also. So, um, this writer and thinker, she belongs to an undivided India. She was born in 1880 in the village of Paraban in uh, Rangpur in North, modern day North Bangladesh. All right. So at that time when she was born, this was in undivided India and this was a British colony. And she championed the cause of women's liberation and wrote both fiction and nonfiction. So, um, in 1880, she was born to a wealthy Zamindar family. So the Zamindars are landlords, feudal landlords. Unlike all the Zamindars of this time, her father was liberal enough to have all the sons educated, both in traditional and Western injunctions. But like all the Zamindars of his time, they, uh, he exercised a conservative belief of having all women of his 
uh, family observe the parda. So the parda is like the veiling and uh, uh, every uh, woman in undivided India and even today, they almost always observe the parda, whichever religion they belong to. So normally what happens is that the parda is associated with only Muslims doing this, Muslims observing the veil and all that. But the veiling system or the parda system has been a part of India for thousands of years. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. So, um, however, this was uh, like very strictly observed in the upper class Hindu families and also the elite Muslim families who were normally zamindars or landlords. And uh, with this, she was also one of those people. Uh, her family observed this conservatively and therefore with this came two things that the women were not supposed to be going out into the public at all. And the second thing was that women's education was very much limited, negligible at the sense. Uh, negligible because uh, women were only supposed to read and not even write, but read and write whatever was included in the religion. For example, in the case of Muslims, they were supposed to read the Quran and the Hadith and these things only. Western education was not promoted. And in the case of Hindus also, it was the same thing. The women had to read, read the scriptures and, thing, and nothing beyond that. So um, this is what her situation was. Her informal education, however, was contributed to her by her elder brother, to whom she has dedicated the novel, novella Padmara. So among these people, there were a few people like her elder brother, who did promote women's education. And this is very important because there were very few and far between. As was customary, she was married off at the young age of 16 to uh, Bahadur Sayyid Sakhawat Hussain, her husband, a deputy magistrate in Bhagalpur in Bihar. So now she shifts from Bangladesh to, into Bihar, which was a princely state at that time also. A man of progressive ideas and liberal thoughts, he helped Rukaya to study and become proficient in English. Soon she published in several Indian periodicals of her time with the name Mrs. R. S. Hussain. Her writings are little, but they have immense significance. She mostly wrote in Bengali. Uh, Moti Chur 1 and Moti Chur uh, 2, which came out in 1904 and 1922, are two volumes of her anthology of essays. Padma Rag, 1924, is a novella, to name a few important works. And she wrote only one novella in English, and that is Sultana's Dream. It came out in 1905. And ahead of a lot of writers of her time, uh, both in content and genre, it comes as a surprise she authored a few comic strips as well. So this is something that is unknown in this part of the world at that time. Um, her literary activities cover three decades, from 1903 to 1932. Women, especially Bengali Muslim women, were the focal of point of her thoughts. She had, however, a broader vision that encompassed not only her own community, but all Bengali women in general. Leaders, reformers, and educationists, such as Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan of Aligarh, described as the Muslim counterpart of the Hindu reformer Raja Ram Mohan Roy, anxious to accept Western science, but without damaging the fabric of Islam, soon convinced Bengali Muslim readers such as Nawab Abdul Latif and other members of Mohammedan Literary Society of Calcutta, that Bengali Muslim males should acquire more modern formal education in order to compete with the Hindus. So here I would like to uh, divert a little bit and say that in this time, in uh, like the 1800s, when we had in the West ideas of enlightenment and the printing press was pressing, uh, was printing a lot of stuff, uh, both uh, in terms of rational uh, knowledge and scientific knowledge, especially brought in by um, 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 the essayist Bacon. He was a scientist before. So what I would like to say is that these ideas were percolating through trade and commerce into the colonies also. And uh, Indians, the Indians of the colonies who were 
uh, who had studied, who had been to the West, these people were enlightened by these ideas as well. And we have Raja Ram Mohan Roy, a Bengali reformer who was foremost important in uh, making uh, the status of, in uplifting the status of women through widow remarriage. So this is something that he promoted. Earlier widows were not to be remarried. In the case of Muslims also, we have Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who was a modern educator and reformer of those times. And he did a lot to convince and establish that women's education or any education, in fact, for men also, education of the sciences was not thought of as necessary. So these were people who were promoting scientific, rational education, as well as Western education. So this percolated down to the women who were also activists at that time. And Rukhaya Sakhavat Hussain, who had already begun writing under the patronage of her husband, she was also enlightened by these thoughts. In line with this movement, such as Widow Remarriage Act, which was passed in 1856, at the, uh, and the Age of Consent Act, which fixed the minimum legal age of marriage for girls at 12 years, which was passed in 1891 and 1866, which was a landmark year from which Brahmo women were allowed to come out of the parda. Uh, this was very remarkable and this promoted women's education. Although parda had always been followed in the subcontinent, the Muslims were reluctant to let go of it because of the orthodox injunctions preached by the ulemas of the time which regarded women's education as a hurdle in the progress of patriarchal values to be honored by Muslim men. However, the hadith, um, the uh, religious narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also emphasized the fact that education was very important. It says that in um, the book, Jami Al-Tarmidi, um, verse 2647, uh, narrated by Anas bin Malik, the messenger of Allah said, Who goes, uh, whoever goes to seeking knowledge, then he is in Allah's cause until he returns. Also, it says, Whoever takes a path upon which to obtain knowledge, Allah makes the path to paradise easy for him. Also, it says that for seeking knowledge, you can go as far as China, and that is very uh, well known, especially. So this, uh, this is something that was there in the religion, and this is something that was preached by Islam in general, basic Islam, but however, the sociocultural values of the uh, undivided India did not allow the patriarchal society to let women educate themselves. In such a sociocultural setup, where we have women who struggle to even hold on to an identity, Meager as it may be, if women come out and fight for women's cause at the expense of heavy criticism, we will indeed call such women as Nawab Fawzin Nasa Chaudhrani and Rukhaya Sakawat Hussain as remarkable progressive women. When we begin to read Hussain's work, we find much of it as feminist writing, as in her works such as Trijatir Abanati, that is the degradation of women, Ardhangi, the female half, Borka, the cloak, these are three essays that she wrote. These are considered as preliminary statement of the problem of Parda. When we move ahead to study Padma Rag and Sultana's Dream, these are the two novellas. One Padma Rag is in Bengali and Sul uh, Sultana's Dream was originally written in English. We enter into the genre of feminist speculative writing. An utopic writing uh, carries the futuristic vision. And in the book, The Principle of Hope, uh, Locke suggests that individuals are unfinished and hope for a better life. In a similar manner, feminist utopic writers focus on a better future. And in the presentation of their utopias, positive social transformations suddenly take place and give women the power to move from their subjugated position to one where they can express feminist values of freedom and equality. In Padma Rag, Hossein creates an utopian world, Tarani Bhavan, where uh, women of all classes, castes, and religions come together to find a sanctuary from the everyday violence that they have to suffer. Siddika is a character in Padmara. She is able to make bold statements with regard to her rights because of the education that she has gotten. Uh, 
She also wants to lead an independent life because of the economic independence that she exercises. She says, quote, by serving Tarani Bhavan for the rest of my life, I will try to work for the welfare of women and support the, uh, and uproot the seclusion system. Siddika's character gives us a window, a window to view Rukaya's feminist stance. Much like her character in the novella, Rukaya too thought of ways to create an utopia around her by contributing to women's education and upliftment through establishment of the Bengal Anjuman, later known as the Anjumane Kwatin Islam Bangla, uh, an association for Bangla women, uh, Muslim women. Through the establishment of this foundation and the Sakawat Memorial Girls School, um, here I would like to diverse again. Uh, the Sakawat Memorial School, Girls School, was uh, started by her in memory of her husband who died very early on in her marriage. And uh, now it is run by the government of India. And it promotes women's education in the same manner as in Rukhaya Sakawat Hussain began uh, with those ideals. So um, with the starting of the Sakawat Memorial Girls School, she aimed to uplift the wretched condition of Muslim women in particular, and all women of the Bengali middle class in general. This earned her a lot of criticism from a lot of writers around her. Girish Chandra Sen, one editor of the monthly magazine Mahila, where she, uh, several of her works were published, also said, coming out of the seclusion, if they move here and there, Women don't become independent. Even then, in many cases, there increases willfulness, danger, and nuisance. Also, the liberal magazine Nabanur stated, the authoress should think that what is achievable for her is not possible for all women folk of the country. This is patriarchy speaking. So actually, even educated people would not let women progress. Padma Rag was published in 1924. And in the preface of this uh, novella, Hussein writes that this was written 22 years prior to its publishing, which would suggest that her view vis-a-vis -vis women's education and upliftment had been formed very early on in her life and had remained a constant. We are told that the practice of slavery has been universally abolished, but does that mean that we women have gained freedom? This Hossein writes in her essay, Sri Jatir Abanati, she is not to be taken lightly. Given her bang, uh, background and her placement in the Indian subcontinent, one of the largest colonies of the British Empire. Also, when she talks of equality among men and women within the fold of marriage, she seems to be influenced by the Victorian idea of companionate marriage, wherein men and women are supposed to be companions of each other. Hussein writes of two types of utopias. At the root of this is the idea to reform society, a concept that critics believe engaged in the West with the writing of Thomas More's Utopia. However, it is also known that this idea was brought into the colonies by the Enlightenment and printing press. Sultana's Dream is another feminist work which can be safely put in the speculative fiction genre. In Ladyland, the utopian world of women, where the narrator is taken around by Sister Sarah and shown the remarkable achievements of educated women who have been reformed from, uh, who have been removed from the confinement of the Zenana. We, uh, Zenana is the harem. We get an idea of what Hussein envisioned for women of her times. And this is remarkably quite ahead of writings that were taking place in this genre, uh, especially by feminist writers in the West. We have a novel by the title Her Land by Charlotte Gilman, which came out in 1915, which talks of an advanced world where women were allowed to meddle with the use of science and technology, as is also evident in Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas in uh, 1938. It should be noted here that Hussein had written Sultana's Dream in 1905, 10 years prior to such work being published in the West. Lady Land is a civil society, not run by men, who have been uh, confined to the Mardana. That is one uh, interesting thing that uh, Sakhavat Hussain has created, the Zenana confirmed to the Vana, uh, Mardana. So I'll just be concluding now. Here, women embody values of nationality, but also uphold the virtue of cultured models. The women are 
actively engaged in politics, business, and sciences. And the wonderful thing is that a lot of their work is error-free and prompt, unlike men's work. You need not be afraid of coming across a man here. This is Lady Land, free from sin and harm. Virtue herself reigns here. In and beyond subcontinent of India, in the large context of global intellectual thought, we can safely say that although late in recognizing the presence of feminism and speculative fiction in the East, we should pay tribute to such women as Rukhaya Sakhavat Hussain, who were trendsetters in their own right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zafir. And I would like to open the room for any questions. And if nobody has questions, I do have some <laughs> for both of you. I, uh... I'll go ahead uh, and ask a question, um, and then if uh, nobody has an additional question, then my colleague Aristomir can come in and ask a question. First of all, I really enjoyed both of the presentations, and they uh, they actually work together in a really fascinating way because um, there is a kind of commonality in uh, in a sort of focus on education and optimism, uh, and, and and they they speak from that time of uh, of a sort of um, collective buy-in to these sort of these sort of um, utopian uh, world reshaping, world conquering projects that. Um, it's hard to, I mean, in some ways, I guess we sort of have a kind of techno utopianism, uh, today that, you know, somehow in the 11th hour, uh, we'll figure out how to save things like the climate crisis and so on and so forth. But, uh, but in general, I'm inclined to say that, that our, we're, we're, uh, we're not as optimistic, <laughs> Uh, rightly or wrongly, as as um, as perhaps uh, these two texts point to um, from an, from a, a kind of a modernist time. So I was wondering, um, you know, if 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 I'm wrong in in seeing that connection, it's a question to both of the presenters. Do do you see a kind of shared attitude across the um, the when we talk about these two uh, authors and the sort of larger projects that they um, come out of? Ishwar, would you like to respond first? Uh, please go ahead, Harold, first. Okay. Would you like me to go ahead? Yes, yes, yes. please do. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you, Matthew, for, for um, sort of making this connection. Um, um, of course, uh, I sort of see it along uh, sort of a continuum that leads from uh, utopia uh, as regards uh, the author presented to us by Kishwar uh, to sort of a uh, a terrifying dystopia as uh, regards the outcome uh, mm -hmm. during the National Socialist period. I mean, mm -hmm. these were, of course, um, wonderfully formulated, quote unquote, yeah, and presented ideas. They were widely um, uh, publicized through various types of media in Germany, but we all know what they led to, right? I mean, they were supporting as is the cause not just with Hartmann's book, but also some other uh, texts. Uh, I mentioned Fritz Bechtel, for example, but then also widely, widely screened, uh, quote unquote, documentaries of these expeditions from 1934 and 1936 that were um, a compulsory viewing, for example, by the, for the Hitler Youth in Munich and so on. Um, that essentially, um, um, produced a military mindset. And, and in, in that sense, yeah, it was powerful, but clearly to what end an utterly destructive end, right? So I see the connection and I'm glad you brought it up. So those are my comments on, on Matthew, your observation. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like to say is that um, 
you see, uh, right now, when let me just go into another area, and that is eco criticism. A lot of dystopic work is taking place, being worked out in that area, especially feminist dystopic work, also. All right. So when we have writers in the West, such as uh, Margaret Atwood writing something, or such as when we have Doris Lessing also writing about future dystopian worlds, such as uh, the novel uh, Mara and Dan, right? So uh, you see the idea that utopia does not exist and that utopia will one day go into dystopia is something that is uh, you know, at the back of every human being, be it a male or be it a female. It's at the back of the human being that the utopia is never achievable. It's not there. Whereas dystopia is very much uh, present. It's always present, especially in the world in which we have, uh, we are paying more and more importance to climactic changes right now. And we have all these climate change uh, conferences and climate change things. So when at a time when uh, Hossein was writing this work, it was unthought of and unheard of in those times to think of this kind of a scenario wherein a woman would lead in Ladyland, women lead. Women are politicians, women are scientists, women do everything which men cannot do perfectly because the simple reason, one of the things that Sister Sarah says, women do work pro, uh, very quickly and very efficiently because men take too much smoking breaks. We women do not do that. <laughs> so we are able to perform better. That means that women have lesser number of vices according to a typical utopian, feminist utopian thought, women have lesser number of vices than men. So yes, there is a connect. And in the modern world, we are moving on from the idea of utopia because we are so much gathered by the idea of dystopia that utopia seems unachievable even now. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zafir. If I can ask you one question which really intrigued me. I sometimes teach uh, in the English department at the University of Louisville courses on science fiction or incorporate science fiction and utopian and dystopian works. And I have heard about Degum Rokea and the Sultana's Dream. This work was also unique, I guess, because it was written in English, right? At a time yes. when the English language signified something very specific and something which was normally, I believe, discouraged in the Bangla, basically, culture. How do you see this playing out? You know, this is a science fiction utopian, basically, novel, which in some ways reminds us of older works like The City of Ladies by Christine Dupizan, or, you know, The Blazing World by Margaret Cavendish, which speculate about a society which is governed by women or by one woman, depending on which text you, you go with. How do you see this choice to use English as being, you know, significant given the themes and given the sort of very progressive, very radical ideas for the time that Begum Rokea was trying to, you know, to to, to put forward. How is the English medium, the language of the different culture, which comes with a different mindset and different political significance playing out here? Um, see, this was a time, this was a time when uh, the British Empire, through the Macaulay's Minutes, was trying to put in the uh, English education into the elite society of India, uh, undivided India so that they would be able to better control the natives. Now, when uh, when these aristocratic people and Rukhaya Sakhawat belonged to the elitist society, she was landlord by, uh, landlord by birth, she married one also, all right? However, what we find is that uh, when she has gone through all of these things also, her husband let her be educated in English, um, become proficient, begin writing, writing in all these things but she was writing in Bangla first and this is the only thing that she wrote in English and a couple of other essays also. What is important is that she wanted to reach out to the English and tell them that 
women of india are being are able and are capable of being educated in english as well and can write uh, things like any other woman in the west another thing to note here is that like in the victorian times when women were hiding their names and writing under pseudonyms in this time when women were not at, supposed to be educated in india um, especially um, women all right they were not supposed to be educated in this time rukhaya sakhawat husain did not take a pseudonym she was like very bold and very daring okay in the beginning she used mrs r s husain but then later on she wrote uh, after getting the title begum she got she wrote begum rukhaya sakhawat husain so like also this you can say that she has taken on her husband's name because her family name was sabar but she's taken on her husband's name so she's like you know merging those societies the culture that she belongs to with the culture that comes with the mm -hmm. that in both cases and by getting and writing in english she wants to tell the women the bangla women especially and uh, muslim women in particular because muslims were highly marginalized Uh, women were highly marginalized in terms of education at that time also in terms of the rights that they should exercise they had no rights as such like i told you widow widow remarriage was introduced widows were not supposed to be married even when rukhaya was uh, widowed when her husband died she had a very difficult life because her husband's son and uh, family they moved her out of her house they deprived her of, of her the status they deprived of of her inheritance etc and she had to start from scratch now when somebody is doing this and then somebody is doing this in english she gives out a very bold message the message that i can achieve this despite all other circumstances mm -hmm. then any woman can achieve this too and one important thing is bengalis were always fascinated by the english that is why the cal calcutta was the capital of india and that is uh, calcutta was a very special place so bengalis had a very strong touch a direct touch with uh, the english and therefore getting english education in bengal was not thought of as very uh, demeaning mm -hmm. as in other parts of the country that english is a foreign language and then english should not be you know promoted and all that the bengalis did not have this kind of a thought as such even writers such as rabindranath tagore they wrote in english but this is much later and she is much earlier so you see when she is writing in english she is giving a bold message actually that uh, any woman is capable of doing this i can do this you can do this too that is uh, what i think that comes out from this thank you thank you professor hubersh thank you very much for your talk i was wondering when i was listening to the story of the political appropriation of the diaries of hans hartmann what happens with the personal space that is usually so important in establishing a relationship between the writer and the reader in the diary how does this personal space continue to exist especially given the fact that as you explained his diaries were heavily sort of prefaced and by by the only survivor if i remember well from the expedition right uh, mm -hmm. one of his colleagues and friends uh, uli luft if i'm if i'm not mistaken what happens with the personal space in the diary which is so you know becomes so essentialized i guess as a struggle you know and as a kind of an achievement which has such obvious national nationalistic and political implications what happens with the personal in this context that's a very good question and the reason i'm i gave this presentation today is because i'm presently in the process of actually translating both diaries uh, from german into english and of course uh, there you get in, into very close contact with the language itself right and i think uh, what makes these uh, diaries so fascinating that is that they on the one hand uh, are i at least believe yeah uh, of course i'm not of that audience at the time of the 1930s early 1940s audience 
But I think uh, Hartmann was very capable of, of, of uh, sort of maintaining that personal space, uh, expressing that personal space, the personal experience to his uh, readers, to his readership. Um, what makes uh, the, the Kanchen Junga diary so uh, fascinating is that uh, in it, uh, and I wish I have had more time to, to incorporate that, but in it, Hartmann speaks repeatedly of his feet. Uh, and that's really, really important. Um, he had in 1928 attempted uh, the so-called Bianco Ridge uh, uh, in the Swiss Alps and uh, essentially frozen his toes. Uh, his toes as well as uh, both his middle feet had to be uh, amputated and presented a huge challenge for his uh, future uh, climbing endeavors. He was able to overcome that. He was able to go to uh, uh, onto two um, um, Himalaya expeditions, but it's it's this very very personal note of 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 dealing with this injury of 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 feet not for example fitting into boots anymore and uh, still having to go down the mountain. I mean, it's, this is extremely relatable, and I think that's how he creates this very very personal space, right? Um, so from a propagandistic point of view, yeah, you have a text that is immensely relatable by your everyday reader, yeah. And onto that text, yeah, you cannot uh, only sort of um, add your own quote unquote message, yeah, appropriate for your purpose, appropriated for your purpose. But the fact that, for example, at the beginning of um, the Nagarpara diary, we have this uh, poem, yeah, um, by Walter Flex, who was essentially known by pretty much everybody who went to school in Germany at the time, yeah. Um, immediately opens the door for this other type of approach, yeah, and interpretation, yeah. So I think you have both aspects uh, present in those texts, and that's why I think they uh, I, they should be, I think, um, translated simply because they provide us with a really unique view, yeah. Uh, on the one hand, for this for this individual fascination, but also how these texts then open themselves up for uh, appropriation, yeah for a larger political uh, and ultimately very destructive cause. They do, it's amazing. I remember when I was a young child still in uh, living in Bulgaria, when a famous Bulgarian mountaineer got lost in a Mount Everest expedition, us kids were speculating for months what may have been his last words, you know, what may have actually happened. It was a story which really uh, is able, capable, as you say, to capture, to sort of, you know, captivate the imagination of the young in a very powerful way. So this is always something which has fascinated me about similar diaries and, you know, works which blend the personal with, as you say, the political and need to maintain a very careful balance because, you know, in sort of... Uh, accomplishing the propaganda aspect, you also need to make this a human endeavor because ultimately those stories are, you know, this sort of uh, struggle to go to the summit and this sort of, you know, uh, striving to, to always reach for something higher is something which is very human, I think, and very still an ideal which we all cherish. So um, it's very, very, as you say, it's, it's very, you know, it's you, the texture is unique, you know, you have to really navigate it very carefully to separate, you know, one from the other. And there's, Are there there's, any more questions for our presenters? You know, I'll jump in and, and ask one one last question. Having listened to the discussion, and um, the and it's coming back to this notion of utopia and dystopia, and um, really jumping on. Uh, Aristomir, your observation that uh, there's still something extractable from uh, these, uh, and talking about the these narratives of, of the Himalayan expedition and of the, um, the what we used to say stuff like the human spirit and you know it's unconquerable mm -hmm. desire to triumph and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and that that. You know, when I, I was a student of Frederick Jameson and he, he wrote a book called Archaeologies 
of the future and he 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 he, he has a subtitle on it that's called like on that uh, where he calls like uh utopia a a drive um that you know we may not be able to realize it mm -hmm. and uh that it's a regulative ideal that we you will never realize it but you understand what it is mm -hmm. and that it is uh as basic as the drive to reproduce and eat and sleep and so forth to to try to achieve it um but there is this sense and, and that that uh that when we look at how this played out in the context of national socialism in world war ii and the Final solution and and all of that, uh, which as a as a Jew is something that's you know in my mind as well that uh, we we seem unable to retrieve um, this utopian desire uh, and and that we may be uh, the worse, sorry, we may be the worse for it, you know, uh, particularly if facing a struggle um, like climate change where it, it is going to require a kind of collective action um, that, uh, that if, it's going to, if it's going to happen, it's going to be facing down the demons mm -hmm. of, recognizing that collective action doesn't necessarily always end up uh, in Auschwitz. It, it, in this case, it may be the only way we save the earth. Um, so I just wonder, uh, as our conversation has gone into these kinds of questions, um, I guess if I'm a kind of oddball in, uh, in, in seeing that where the two presentations come together is in a need to figure out a way of revitalizing uh, a kind of utopian aspiration for today. If I may respond to that, I, I think sure. it's a very worthwhile discussion. And what intrigued in my mind, at least, was uh, the question of um, not only the way you phrased it, uh, Matthew, but also when does a utopia sort of flip over into a dystopia? Uh, sometimes we seem to be very, very incapable of, of, of um, making that call, maybe because we are too caught up in the utopia and making it happen yeah, in the first place. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, if we look at um, the, the, the German mountaineers of the 1920s and 1930s, they were driven yeah, by this notion of um, let's make Germany um, a recognizable uh, national entity again. Let's make it even great again. Yeah, this clearly came out of World War One. Yeah, and was understandable uh, at that, but uh, clearly it had consequences that. Uh, um, at some point really drifted off into the dystopia that just referred to Matt. Yeah. So it's 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 this particular point in the middle somewhere or along this continuum uh, and telling yeah, that very moment uh, when the danger is getting very, very real. Yeah. Um, that that interests me. I mean, you could, for example, also argue as regards uh, global warming, for example, the idea of providing mobility, yeah to uh, um, human beings is not in and by itself a bad uh, idea, yeah? moving from the horse onto the, uh, uh, the motor car. Yeah? But uh, that sort of utopia at some point had really, really negative consequences and we really were unable to foresee them. So th those are my, my two cents on that, uh, on that question. Um, can I say something here? Please. Um, you see, Everyone, I believe, is in search of a utopia as such. Look at all the number of refugees that are trying to make homes in other parts of the world where they have faced uh, dystopia, right? They move from, uh, the dystopia could be natural, it could be man-made, it could be anything. And all of these people are trying to escape that dystopia. Uh, 
they're not waiting for the uh, you know uh, the apocalypse to happen as yet for them it has already happened and then they're moving and when they're moving in the process of movement uh, we hear we hear a lot of news about people drowning uh, you know, while crossing the rivers, while crossing the seas, etc. Refugees such as people who are migrating into France and Germany, uh, the Syrians and all of these people, they have experienced a dystopia already. And then they're trying to move on to an utopia for them, that new country, that new place, that new time, etc. is the new them and the new utopia that they're looking for. In similar manner, when we talk about the wastage that we create and the technology that we need to eradicate the wastage that we have created, we are again looking for an utopia, a world which will be clean and a world which will be nice, a world which will go back into the pastoral like it existed before. And then we're not able to do that. And then uh, the talk about how this utopia suddenly becomes dystopia I'm reminded of like when you're talking about the mountains and the um, snowfall and if, et cetera, I'm reminded of a story of Jack London uh, about two dogs, um, the story of a dog and a person. I don't recall what that thing is. He's going from into in a desert snow, uh, in a snow desert. And there is this place where he suddenly experiences frostbite and he cannot move. And the dog actually uh, comes to help, but then he then says the dog itself senses that he may or it may also have the same circumstances, and therefore he abandons his owner. The man is left to die, and the man dies. The uh, dog comes back, and then the dog goes away again because he knows that this area, this idea, this dystopia is something uh, which even he's going to experience. So he goes back into a civilized place where this, uh, where he can find his own utopia. So utopia and dystopia are not just fears of human beings, I would just add here. They're fears of every single hu uh, animal also, every single living creature also, although we, they may not be able to voice it because they're voiceless. The, um, they're marginalized as such and they're voiceless, the non-human, the Anthropocene is something that is happening to everyone. And we are all experiencing it, but we can voice it and some people, some things cannot voice it. So the idea of utopia and dystopia is an existent reality in our current world. That is what I would like to say over here. And switching from one to another is as easy as the flick of a finger. It's like that. Because we cannot get an utopia, it's unattainable as such. And dystopia is running behind us as fast as possible. And we're running towards a kind of an establishment where we would like to create an utopia, but we cannot because eventually apocalypse has to happen. That is my take on all of this. Right. Well, I'm often left um, feeling in an odd way uh, that, you know, again, and this is a sort of Jewish, Euro, North American perspective, but that in an odd way, the, the sort of Hitler inclusion, the Guterdammerung of dragging everything down with them, um, you know, we haven't been able to get out of that whirlpool um, because any type of truly sort of global collective action uh, is still stained um, and is manipulated and has been manipulated uh, in order to demonize, you know, any kind of effort to, to whether it's Greta Thun or whoever that any kind of effort to sort of get everybody on the same page is going to get um you know blocked um matthew i would like to say here that when you have western notions of something and direct opposite eastern notions of something as in uh, you see Edward Said's reading of uh, in Orientalism about what the West is supposed to think of the East, that is also a doctored kind of a thing. 
the East has been there forever mm -hmm. as the West, the native West. I'm not talking about the uh, migrant uh, British people who came into the West. I'm talking about the indigenous people of the world, wherever they have belonged. They have, you know, they have had a sync with nature before uh, the coming of these ideas, uh, which are mainly doctored by technology, the industrial revolution, um, you see patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. But things have existed far uh, into history than what we can recall now. All these people, they had a sync with nature. So when you're saying that things like these are, uh, you know, like there's, a, how can we draw a connection? The connection and a global perspective can be uh, can be brought out when both the hemispheres, or in fact, four all four hemispheres, they join forces culturally. Culture is more important here than just you know figuring out how much uh, you know technology is wasting and uh, causing climatic change, global war uh, warming, etc. If we focus on how cultures operate, then maybe we will be able to have a worldview of all the four hemispheres wherein everyone can work towards a collective common. And that collective common would be uh, you know, beneficial for everybody. I think like that. Thank you. Are there any more questions for our presenters? I would like to thank you, everyone, for the very productive, very engaging discussion. These yeah. are important, big questions, and I'm very happy to have been a part of this panel. And with this, I would like to adjourn our first panel. Thank and you so much. Thank you. We're off to a good start. Thank you. It was very really much. excellent. Thank you very much. Thank but you for organizing you. this and hope to see you next year. Maybe yeah, yeah. Hopefully. we'll be doing we'll it be again beautiful. next year for sure. 51. Oh. Come. Oh, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>